What's up everybody and welcome back to another video on the SAT from the Scalar Learning Channel. First and foremost, happy 2024 to everybody out there and everybody especially who is preparing for this upcoming first round of the digital SAT that will now be provided in the US. So for everyone who's prepping for this digital SAT, we're going to have so much content and so much material over the next two months to make sure to get you ready. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't done so yet. But today what I wanted to focus on was this amazing article that came out this week that talks about the misguided war on the SAT. Now, this all began back in 2020 during the pandemic. A lot of schools went test optional. Some have since gone back, but there was a big debate at the time as to whether or not the tests were biased, whether they provided any value. And subsequently, due to the complications that arose during the pandemic. A lot of schools, and in fact, almost all schools went test optional. So now it seems that the tests are coming back on the scene. And there's a lot of research suggesting that they do provide tremendous value beyond grades. And this video is going to delve into this article and go through everything that is discussed, all these statistics and all the research provided to show that the test scores are actually quite valuable and should be reinstated at most universities. Now, I just want to say first and foremost, if the research changes, if anything changes, right, I, I, I'll be the first to say, hey, fine, let's get rid of these tests. But I said back then, and I continue to say that I do think they provide a lot of value. And if something comes along eventually that replaces them or provides greater value or greater insights into students' capabilities, etc., fine, let's do it. But for now, I do think that they provide better statistics than a lot of metrics that we have in place right now that are used in college admissions, like extracurriculars, grades, etc. So one of the first points that the article makes is that test scores are a better predictor of academic success than high school grades. This is a statement from Christina Paxson, the president of Brown University. And this is further bolstered by Stuart Schmill, the dean of admissions at MIT. Just getting straight A's is not enough information for us to know whether the students are going to succeed or not. And MIT, which we'll talk about later, has gone back to using the SAT and the ACT as a criteria for admissions to great success. They were having a lot of difficulty when they did remove it. The next point that's raised in the article is that test scores can be helpful identifying underrepresented minorities who will thrive. Contrary to what a lot of folks are saying, you know, they're saying the opposite, that the test scores dim diminish diversity. But instead, the research presented in this article shows the opposite. And here's the rationale. Without test scores, admission officers sometimes have a hard time distinguishing between applicants who are likely to do well at elite colleges and those who are likely to struggle. So now they say that they study the issue and the test scores can be particularly helpful in identifying lower income students and under represented minorities who will thrive. And I think the key point is in that last sentence, a solid score for a student from a less privileged background is often a sign of enormous potential. So the main idea is when these test scores are reviewed in context, and that's how they're always looked at, right? They're looked at by, through an admissions process in context of the entire application. They can provide tremendous value and tremendous insight into a student. So in this academic study released last summer by the group Opportunity Insights, they found that there's a strong relationship between test scores and later success. But then they also showed conversely little relationship between high school grade point average and success in college. Why that is, there's a number of reasons which we're going to touch on again later in the video. But part of that, it could be due to grade inflation, could be due to the variance in academic rigor across different high schools. So there's obviously a lot of reason, but the, the, the point is we have the SAT or the ACT, the standardized tests that are given with very little variance from test to test in terms of difficulty. And so I think this is why it's finding to be a more consistent benchmark for success, however you define that. Moreover, student scores are strong predictors of student outcomes after college. So this is some data that was also provided in the article. And you can see here, we're talking about, first of all, just attending an elite graduate school, right? You can see that there's a much stronger positive correlation with the standardized test scores than GPA. And we see the same thing when they talk about working at a prestigious firm. So once again, we see that the test scores do seem to provide just from the numbers, right? Take emotion out of it, take any other argument out of it from the straight numbers. They do provide very valuable insights and information. Now, the point is made in the article, right? That we're not just using our main factor to be the SAT or the ACT, right? And and if that was done, we would see a plummet in racial and economic diversity. But nobody is is supporting that. And that's that's not what the argument is about. The, the question is instead whether scores should be one of the criteria used to identify qualified students from every demographic group. So again, the test scores are a piece of the puzzle that, sh that we shouldn't lose sight of. Viewed in context, they are tremendously helpful. This next point is that other parts of admissions have much larger biases. And this, this was brought to attention several years ago in a video made by SuperTutor TV, which talked about, hey, like, 
when if you're really talking about reducing these socioeconomic biases, we should be way less concerned about standardized test prep than other things. For example, all these crazy extracurriculars that you have access to when you are from an, a more affluent background. As I mentioned here, you receive extensive editing on essays from well-educated parents. So there's, there's a lot of other biases that will play a much bigger role in the other pieces of the admissions puzzle than for standardized tests. Another really great point that the article makes is that the existence of racial and economic gaps don't prove the te that the tests are biased. So I'm going to read this full paragraph because I thought it was, an, it was a really interesting analogy. So they say that to put it another way, the existence of racial and economic gaps in SAT and ACT scores doesn't prove that the tests are biased. After all, most measures of life in America on income, life expectancy, home ownership, and more show gaps. Uh, and no wonder we have a lot of in inequalities, inequities. The problem isn't generally with the statistics however. The relatively high black poverty rate is not a sign that the statistic is biased, nor would scrapping the, the statistic alleviate poverty. So again, they're saying it's more a symptom, not the cause of these inequities. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's something to look at when, if we do see these gaps or these differences, how do we address that? How do we fix the root cause? And maybe how do we balance these things out versus just saying, all right, the, these tests are inherently biased. Not saying that that's an impossibility, but I think this is a more rational approach. This next point was very, very interesting. The, the article author made the point that university administrators quietly value the test scores. So the author states that when they go around and ask administrators whether they are aware, aware of all this research showing the value of the test scores, they said they were, but they were, they said not for quotation, they feared the political reaction if they reinstated the test. So I think that's pretty interesting. And we're in a crazy political climate right now. And I think that makes sense. A lot of people are afraid of backlash, of cancel culture, of all these other things. So I can see what's happening here and why it's happening. But just remember, we have there's a lot of value in the math and the statistics behind what's happening here. And, and another thing I want to point out is when you look at the the landscape of social media, YouTube, Instagram, all these other things where people like myself are getting in the mix and providing all of this free information, free guidance on these tests. A lot of these things are getting leveled out and I think more so than in other arenas. So students now have access to a lot of great education op options that are totally free. And I think as, as we see this continue to progress, I think we're going to see a leveling of the playing field that's going to be represented in these test scores. And one thing I do want to note, I think the SAT and the College Board in particular has been awesome in terms of letting a lot of these YouTube channels and other social media influencers thrive and provide this information for free. I know that there was some issues with the ACT recently going in and clawing back a lot of their publicly released information. They came after my channel. They came after a lot of other channels. Uh, again, you know, what for whatever reason, why they made that decision, I don't know. I think it was totally the, the wrong decision. I think that is definitely pushing people backwards and, again, bringing out these inherent biases that exist. Uh, so whatever their motivations were, I don't know, but I got, I'll, I'll give props to the College Board. I think they've done amazing in terms of supporting free resources that help people on these tests. So the last point that they made, which I think is really important to bear in mind, is that students who suffer the most are those with high school high grades at unknown high schools. And I think that that was mentioned back in 2020 when this whole debate began. It's like, look, if, you, if you're not from a school where they historically send a lot of kids to your university, you haven't heard of it, but you see somebody with a 4.2 or something like that. It's difficult to tell what, what exactly is going on. You, it's hard to kind of measure that high school success across the board. And so those are the guys that are going to suffer the most when, when you remove these standardized tests. And as Deming, a Harvard, Harvard economist said, the SAT is their lifeline. So in conclusion, I thought this was a really interesting article. I think I said the same thing back in 2020 when all this stuff was happening. I did believe that the right move was to bring these tests back, not make it test optional, or perhaps work on the tests, improve them. I think the College Board has done an amazing job of doing that. Now we've got the digital SAT that is right around the corner that's provided greater access to students uh, domestically as well as internationally. And I think the world is waking up. I think we're on the right track. So take it for what it's worth, but I just wanted to put this information out there. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please click that like button. If you want to see more from the Scalar Learning channel, make sure to click subscribe. If you are preparing for the SAT in March, I wish you the best of luck and I will see you in the next video. Take it easy.